Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Welcome again to this segment of the Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Bruce Broussard, your host. And again, as you note, I'm donning my vet. Hey, guys, I'm still telling, hey, I'm telling families, members, the whole nine yard. Hey, get out there and get those vets registered because in all due respect, those services are there for you. Very, very, very important. Okay? Make sure of that. All right? If you, if you find problems with that issue, you can give me a call at 503-701-0457. 503-701-0457. Or call any one of the VFW units, Veterans of Foreign Wars, even if you, did, if you, were, if, even if you weren't in foreign wars, they will still register you and give you your card. Okay, that's for all veterans. Okay, with that, let's get right into the show. As you know, boy, I tell you, I mean, uh, we've not really gotten into the, the national campaign, and so uh, naturally, the one that tends to sticks out the most is the is the presidential campaign. And uh, so, what we're going to do this, this on this particular show for the first thirty minutes or so, we're going to talk about that from an Oregon perspective. And I've got two outstanding individuals. I call them outsiders. They're not politicians. Because I'm, trying, I'm since I'm I'm an outsider myself, but I'm always trying to get politicians to come on. But for some fear reason or whatever, they just don't feel they need to, because it's not a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. It's a government for the politician, and that's where this is all about. Okay, for them, always for them. But anyway, hopefully they can still be invited. They can come. But in this particular situation here, I've got two people here that I know real well and are, are very well respected. Uh, both have, have run for office on several occasions. You've seen Jim Lewenberger as Jim over here on your far left. There's Jim over here, and you've seen Jim before, and you've seen Art Robinson. And Art is, um, is, is he, now he's running. Jim is not running this time around. Art is running this time around. I ran the last time around. I'm not running this time around. But we're all outsiders. But we've got Art right. He's running against DeFazio. Here's a guy who's been in office for 30 years. 30 years. What happened to term limits? Jesus Christ, and then I'm, I'm trying to figure out what about the issues. I've invited this guy many, many times. He won't even respond to his calls. And this, that, and that. Again, that's another major, major problem. I thought it was a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. Since I'm the people, that means I'm the employer and he's the employee, right? I think that works that way. But anyway, <laughs> long and short of it all, but that gives you a little squirt. But anyway, uh, uh, I'm still inviting uh, uh, Congressman uh, DeFazio, because right now during the election period, we have two representatives from the state of Oregon. We have Art and we have DeFazio. Now, that, at the end of November the 8th, we're going to have just one. And uh, I, uh, the presumption winner is, is Art, because he's here. I invited DeFazio, but he wasn't here. <laughs> so, but anyway, the bottom line, I'm just making small note of that piece aspect of it. But let's talk about, gentlemen, uh, let's talk about the national election. Again, that, the presidential election. Because I think that one of the things that the, the biggest cry from the people is that we want to talk about issues. And the media is kind of like taking the issue. Now they're at the table now. I, I thought maybe they were going to really get into the issues. But they're falling in the same trap, so to speak with these little side notes aspect of it, and that's not what we really need now. We've got problems all over the world at this point in time. We've got our own problems here within our own era, if you will, and we just went through eight years of, uh, of President Obama. He's still there until, until January 1, whenever they, that 20th. change with 20th. And, but the bottom line is that uh, what's going to happen to assimilation? You know, we, went, we have gone through somewhat of a assimilation period, and a lot of folks have come up to the table. They've come up to the table and say, hey, I'm somebody too. So what do we do? What, what, what happens in that transition? Who picks up the Pathan aspect of it? That's another major, major, major issue because a lot of little people, and, not just, and it's not just African Americans, it's people from the Deep South. And, I mean, you know, both, both parties have excited, if you will, various groups, both from the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, and an, an outsider in Trump. Trump is really an outsider because he's really excited the little people. A lot of the little people he has excited quite a bit. And so there they are. They say, "Hey, now we got our champion up there now." And boy, I want my I want to be at the front of the line. And we've got the and then we've got the immigration issue aspect of it. We've got undocumented workers that are, that don't understand what undocumented is all about. Uh, we've got we we've got a lack of enforcement aspect of it. We got that whole situation. We got a we got the budget that's running all over the place. We've got we've got now we've got situations where we got one of the candidates, in all due respect, on the Democratic side, are, are promising all these goodies, free college for everybody, 
you know, free chickens in every pot, all kinds of goodies, if you will. And so, uh, it's a real, I'm, I'm throwing that out on the table, but I want these guys to react to this stuff. I want them to jump right on in there. So I'm opening up the door. Let's talk about the, um, the, the, the national campaign, the presidential race. We'll use that as a, as a kind of a, a base aspect of it. And Jim, I'll start off with you. What do you think so far? What's, your, what's been your observation to date? Bring it up. Well, I think the, the only way, and, and the thing that has shocked a lot of people is how close uh, Donald Trump is to Hillary Clinton in terms of poll numbers right now, because mm -hmm. there was a, 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 a lot of people thought it was over uh, you know, as soon as the Democratic convention ended, there was a big gap, right. and he's really closed that gap. Now, I, I think that uh, the debate that we just had, the two two candidate debate that should have been at least a three candidate debate this past Monday, uh, was harmful to him. Frankly, uh, I think he did not do a good job. He, I say, I think the consensus is he did good in the first few, part of the debate, and then right. he he got sidetracked and and uh, uh, really stumbled at the, the second half of the debate. But the one thing he's got going for him is he at least is willing to call a terrorist a terrorist. And he's willing to call an Islamic terrorist a terrorist, or an Islamic terrorist. And neither our president nor Ms. Clinton uh, is willing to do that. And, and that is the one thing that I think the, the people are uh, appreciative of, that one bit of uh, honesty. Mm -hmm. uh, another thing I think is going to be helpful to him is his his adherence to the idea that we should a have a wall between us and Mexico, and that the immigration system is broken, very very badly broken, mm -hmm. and and that's a, I think it's an obvious truth that the Democratic side is refusing to acknowledge, and and many many Republicans are also unwilling to acknowledge, and so to the extent that he's he's able to grab our attention as a, as a, people, I think it's those two issues, immigration and uh, calling a spade a spade in terms okay. of Islamic terrorism. Okay, okay. All right, you're knocking on doors every day. You're running against this guy named DeFazio. Mm -hmm. What are the people saying to you about the whole issue about the presidential race Well, and as far as the issues uh, are concerned? They're all over the place. Most of the people who are voting for me are Republicans, and mm -hmm. most Republicans are supporting Trump. Uh, I think... Uh, if, if you could find it, you know, in all of this flack where they pick five words out of an extemporaneous speech and turn that into the issue of the day every day, it's hard to hear. There's an excellent article the other day in the National Review listing Trump's policies, his actual policies. Those policies win the election every time, but they aren't discussing those policies. You mentioned a couple. Uh, on the Constitution, uh, he doesn't talk about the Constitution. Rush Limbaugh says he's not very political, <laughs> no, ideological. Right. But he's listed the men he would choose, men and women he would uh, choose from for the Supreme Court, and they're, constitution, they're pretty good constitutional people. He definitely realizes that our economy needs lower taxes, lower regulations, and uh, freedom for our entrepreneurs to produce. And he has a good policy on that basis. He understands that the taxes are going way past the peak on the Laffer curve. You reduce the taxes, everybody's better off, including the government. And there are 15 very recent policy statements. Now, none of us would probably agree with all 15. You, you would only agree with part of them. But if you look at the guts of this guy's political policies, the American people would go for him. Peace through strength, right, mm -hmm. as far as the military is concerned. Peace through strength. These guys that are run the country now, it's war through weakness. It's, it's their policy. Should be peace through strength. Stop these wars. His policies are very good. And perhaps that's because the opposition realizes that. And instead, but the guy is an extemporaneous speaker. He speaks extemporaneously hundreds of times for hours. And of course, it's easy to find sound bite, bound bite. So every day we learn he's done some crazy thing. Whereas they're just picking out of these extemporaneous speeches, and none of them have to do with policy, or almost none of them. So on a, on a, uh, if you look carefully at what the man has advocated when he has been careful about, you know, he's written down or he's thought about a lot, or he and his advisors have thought about a lot, pretty good candidate in my view. Uh, what is going on in this campaign is absurd. It's just a, all kinds of screaming and lying. But the people have a pretty simple attitude right now. They're fed up. They know the country's not in good shape. They don't know why. They can't figure it out. 
maybe the libertarians have better ideas than the republicans but at least somebody has to step in and a tough talking new york businessman has appealed to a lot of them well you know you, you make a good point because <clears throat> When I when I thought about that whole piece about um, why Trump, why he fits right now, and you, with all these different things, well, gee whiz, I mean, there's no way in the world the guy didn't even run for dog catcher, let alone president of these United States. But mm -hmm. people are very irritated about the whole issue of undocumented workers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, there's a well, lot of people that are walking out there saying, well, look here, I'm not going to vote for this guy, but they are voting for him. Mm -hmm. Right. See, they are yeah. voting for They're frustrated. They're very upset about the, the, the services that are being misused. When you walk into the hospitals, folks are lined up. And they're, all, they're already undocumented. They don't have to worry about bringing, picking up, pulling out their insurance cards or whatever for services and whatever. People are totally upset. In all due respect, uh, and, and I'm just not trying to take this lightly, whatever, but you get on the buses and this, that, and the other. It's either, if you, if you couldn't, the, the, it's kind of like the assimilation of, 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 of Spanish, if you will, uh, the, 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 uh, the undocumented worker. You know, you've got to accept these folks. And regardless of whether or not they're illegal or not, you will accept them. And, uh, and so, so I think that that's one of the main thing, the, 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 that's, a, that's a heavy, heavy piece aspect of it. And um, so... I'm, I'm throwing that out there to start with. I mean, mm -hmm. that's the main discussion. And even, like you said, even to this date, uh, the, the, the last, de the first debate between he and he and Hillary, Hillary Clinton, uh, it was just that he he just did his thing again. And then when you look at the results aspect of it, I, I looked at that. And I'm a I'm a very avid uh, uh, CNN Fox watcher, both at the same time. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I look at CNN on one side to get the real deal on that end, as opposed to the Fox, because I pretty well know where that's in that. But I noticed when they when they when they when they did the poll, if you looked at CNN, it was a 67-33 or something like that, uh, 67 Hillary and whatever. But the guy who's who who quoted the fact that this was the poll said that uh, uh, two thirds of two thirds of the of the of the of the people that were asked who did they support. Were Democrats. Yeah, he made right. it very clear, but mm -hmm. they used that same poll from that point on. Mm -hmm. well, they there were a lot they, of. They, they uh, didn't. They didn't have the the ostrich mm -hmm. behind the poll that said exactly to tell the people. But really, the polling on who won the debate is right. really irrelevant. What matters is what the effect has been on the. the no, that's right. That's the, the key. And probably that's more importantly, on the borderline states, the right. ones that are right. in play. Right. Uh, Oregon, frankly, is not in play. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the chances of Donald Trump winning Oregon are yeah. diminishingly small, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's true for Washington and California mm -hmm. as well, as well as New York. Well, yeah, he doesn't have a chance of winning New York either. So a lot of states are just are not in play. Mm -hmm. You know, the ones that are really important, I think, are Ohio, Pennsylvania, Florida. Uh, I'm sure you you have a better mm -hmm. list. I mean, but those are the ones that really matter, and it's, mm -hmm. and how. Uh, he's being perceived and how she's being perceived in those states is what really matters. Mm -hmm. um, and as I say, the, the thing is that he's still in the race. Mm -hmm. uh, I was, I, I'm a Mariners fan, and up until yesterday, I, I still had a <laughs> small chance we, we, we might get in the playoffs. <laughs> well, he's got more than just a small chance. Yeah, he, he's got a very yeah, good chance. He's of win. And he's outreaching. That's the other thing. He's outreaching. Because when you think about it, people today don't read the newspapers. They don't look at CNN, the majority no. of the people. They don't look at Fox. You know, it's the majority of the people. So now mm -hmm. the campaign now is who's going to get to those doors with those flyers and speak to people. Well, in the there's video. an old, old, old saying that it, it's not it's not the facts that you say so much as how you how make how you make people feel exactly. about you or exactly. how you make you feel about themselves. <laughs> exactly. And and um, that's still very much up in the air. I, I think one of the things that people are very concerned about is. Uh, is Hillary Clinton healthy enough to to uh, campaign yeah. and to to be president? And I think there's some really significant doubts about that. Um, and, and we know nothing about her her vice president uh, running mate. Mm -hmm. um, so I mean that is a legitimate concern. And there's the lying, the constant lying. The woman can't say the truth even if it would, it would <laughs> do her a, a good. Yeah. She has to lie about absolutely everything from health on down. And so I, I think to the extent that the people are upset about uh, dishonesty, uh, you know, she's trying to paint him as being equally dishonest. And, and, and I'm, he's not exactly uh, he's not exactly perfect in terms of right, right, honesty right, right. and consistency. But compared to her, you know, he's better. Mm -hmm. you know, that's not exactly a ringing endorsement. I didn't intend to be. I, as I said, <laughs> yeah, I, my, my candidate of choice was Ted Cruz. Right, right, right. He's, well, but he's not I on was, the ballot. I was well, a Cruz man, too. 
I mean, when Cruz, three days before Cruz dropped out, I was driving a 26-foot truck full of Cruz signs, distributing them all over northern mm -hmm. Oregon and mm -hmm. southern Washington. Right. I thought Ted Cruz was the best mm -hmm. choice. But really, it, our country's not in good shape. It's a long way from where it should be. And you, you're not going to get back in one step. And just because this guy doesn't, isn't your idea of how a president looks and talks and so forth, if you look at his policies, they are a step back from the abyss and a step toward where we should be. And you can do better in each election. Uh, but this, uh, this dishonesty, as you say, is just unbelievable. And the things in, in, in Trump's case, as I say, he's a tough-talking American. If you listen to a bunch of Americans talking, drinking beer and watching football, that's the way they talk. And nobody gets real careful about exactly what his facts are, you know. They just talk. We're Americans. And if, you, if the facts really matter, even if you're a scientist, you might do that while you're mm -hmm. watching a football game. Mm -hmm. But when you got down to science, you got to get it perfect because you can't have any error. Uh, but if you take a man like that and you listen to him for a hundred hours and you start picking phrases, well, you can make him sound dishonest. Mm -hmm. He's, and you know, this guy's built buildings in New York City. You know what New York City's like? Hey, New York, buddy. <laughs> you have to put up with every yeah. kind of. Uh, well, both candidates of, uh, are from New York. I remember now. I remember well, that. nominally, one is, well, one he isn't. is. He is. Yeah, he's she from, isn't. Yeah, she's from, yeah, from but, I'm just, I'm Illinois. But New York is New York. There's only one New York in this country, so to speak, in this world, as far as right? Okay, okay. Right. Now, look, one, one guy, <laughs> one, one, one person we're forgetting, I think he's still in the race, so to speak, is Bernie Sanders. What? Where's Bernie? Where's Bernie? Every time we turn around, there's a still, there's Bernie still there, you know, he's making yeah. some noise, you know, I mean, you know, here's the, here's the only so socialist in this country that was, that was basically running for president on the Democratic ticket. 25% of the well, people was a Green would vote party for candidate. pure socialism. Well, it was a Green Party candidate socialist. Yeah, know, but, my point, yeah. but my point is that in terms of, in terms of uh, uh, credibility, in terms of numbers, that's what, Bernie was right up there. Oh, yes. He, he put, you know, he didn't go away quietly. No. Uh, but well, until the convention. I, I, I haven't heard any look out of him since the convention. So. What would have happened if Bernie had just said, okay, fine, well, okay, fine, I ran on the Democratic ticket, now I'm going to take my shingle and, and run on the, run on the socialist ticket or the, or the Libertarian ticket or the Green Party ticket or the Constitution Party. You think that would have, what, what, what would have happened then? Would he have taken his folks and, and still maintain his steel platform? What do you think then? What would have happened? Would the people have followed him? I, I don't think so. That's a good question, but I don't. I don't think so. I mean, it. You know, uh, well, remember how much heat Ralph Nader got uh, a few years back when he right. ran against uh, um, in, in the presidential candidate, refused to drop out. Right. Um, uh, there are people who still attribute George Bush's win to Ralph Nader being, you know, state about mm -hmm. three percent of the vote. Um, I don't think Bernie could have. Uh, I don't. It, I'm sure he thought about it, but I'm also sure that, that he was warned that if he did that, it would they would he'd be destroyed politically, and mm -hmm. uh, yeah. he didn't have the courage to do it. But he was an outsider. And when you think about when you He's think been about in the Senate when, forever. When, no, I'm just saying from the Democratic side in terms of I'm just looking at it from an outsider standpoint. I think people looked at him just as an outsider, like other folks were, because he, otherwise you he, many Democrats didn't like the idea that he was running under that ticket anyway. Right, but I think what, what I think the reason for his popularity was that people believed that he's telling the truth as he yeah. understood it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now he, I, they also thought he was crazy, and, but but they thought he was being honest mm -hmm. about what he believes. And uh, frankly, you know, his his policies are, would be disastrous. Mm -hmm. um, just as I'm afraid Hillary Clinton's policies are pretty much just like Bernie Sanders. Just she's a little bit smoother about mm -hmm. packaging them. Mm -hmm. They would be, they'll be disastrous for us too, and the thing is that we have a four-four Supreme Court. That's one of the other things I think that yeah, that's, that's the other reason. That's the main. That's the main. That's one. Of, that was four, the four. main main deal. That's a huge and, thing. And yep. and whoever wins is going to be picking at least one, two, yes. three new Supreme Court justices, mm -hmm. and uh, it's going to have a huge impact on on where we go. Um, uh, the, one of the key issues for me is the right to keep and bear arms. And, and uh, the U.S. Supreme Court decision, our decision a few years back, said that uh, the, uh, the Second Amendment protects the individual right to keep and bear arms. Four justices who are still on the Supreme Court disagreed with that. And I don't know how they could possibly do that, you know, uh, legitimately, but they haven't disavowed their, their views. And, and um, uh, uh, you know, 
all it takes is one more uh, picked by a Democrat, and uh, we may well lose our right to keep and bear arms, at least the way the Supreme Court interprets it. Now, of course, that raises an important thing is, um, you know, who decides what the Constitution means? You know, for a long time, the U.S. Supreme Court has said, we decide, but you know, that's not in the Constitution. No. It's not. No, they, that, was a, that was a power they grabbed for themselves and, and did it during when Thomas Jefferson was president. And he vehemently disagreed with that assertion of power, as have many people since. And there, it's not in the Constitution. It was discussed as to what the role of the U.S. Supreme Court would be. And it was not included in the Constitution on purpose. Uh, they basically grabbed that most important power. Uh, but, it, you know, it's also kind of in... I Kind of, I'm a big deal about the Constitution. Okay, go, no uh, problem. But Good. one of the things about the, in the Constitution is every officer that is federal, state, local, every officer has to take an oath to support and defend the United States Constitution. Yeah. Uh, in order to do that, every officer must know what the Constitution says <laughs> in order to fulfill that oath. Well, that means that every officer and, frankly, every citizen has to know what the Constitution says and means. It's not a job left only to the court. And it really shouldn't even be that the, the court has the last word. It has to be the people ultimately have the last word. And who represents the people? Well, n no, the people have to represent themselves. Uh, but I'm just, that's what we're no, looking but that, for now. I know, but, see, but that's the key thing. We yeah. can't be lazy. We can't yeah. let some Superman or Superwoman, you know, save us or lead us, really. The whole purpose, of the, the, the guiding philosophy of the United States of America is the people are in charge. Right, right, right. And not only does that begin in, in the preamble to the Constitution, we the people, but it's also in the Oregon Constitution, also very much the people are in charge of the government and the way the state is run, and the people are supposed to be in charge of the way the United States is run. So, I mean, that, that, that's both... Uh, uh, an encouragement and also basically an indictment of the American people. We've let our servants take over when they shouldn't take over. But we have our representation, the representative that elected to office. Well, yeah, but uh, they but have... They, but as he pointed out, they then swear an oath to follow the Constitution. And they're not, so... You, you entrust them with the government for a while. Right. You don't make them dictators right. that can ignore the Constitution. Okay. The statement he just made in the last five minutes is fantastic. Every American should understand that statement. If they did, we wouldn't be in the trouble we're in. He's and absolutely and right. And you're right. That's the and, problem. Uh, they, they've taught. We live in a constitutional republic. But they've taught the people they live in a democracy where if you get 51 percent of the vote, you can vote away a man's life, liberty, and property. That isn't what we live in. The founders were dead opposed to democracy because every democracy in history has descended into mob rule. This is not a democracy. Well, tell, tell and me this, this is what uh, he's just eloquently I, stated, I, I, how that applies to this whole situation. I appreciate this, but what about the masses out there? They don't understand well, that's this. Right. It's, that's, it's not taught in the schools. That's one of the reasons the Tenth Amendment Majority. gave the education system to the states and the people. The federal governments usurped that, too. Well, you see, the thing is that that, that is available to <clears throat> everybody. For, you know, Now, one of the big things... Is copy. Just, one of the things that just bad, bad things that just happened is that we've given up sovereignty or power over the Internet. Yeah. We've now ceded that. The U.S., the U.S. was in charge of the, you know, what could be on and couldn't be on the, the Internet. Now we've agreed to let go of that power, and that's going to be an international tribunal, which is going to include communists or the Chinese and the Russians who have, uh, you know, a, a war against free speech and free expression. And so it, to the I, I'm, I'm a fair, I'm afraid, you know, right now that's available on the Internet. A lot of this other, is available on the Internet. Yeah, a lot of other good things are available right, on the Internet. Right, the right, Bible, right, right, a lot right, of things are on right, the Internet. right. The, the day may come when those things are taken off the Internet yeah. and, and become impossible to find. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how long. What about our classrooms? We've lost our, our classrooms long ago. The public classrooms have been long, long gone. The advantage the Internet gave us was for the first time in history, the truth could stand behind the lie, beside the lie and have an equal chance in the public discourse. Before the Internet... The newspaper could tell a lie, and there was no means for the truth to be heard, and a lie could stand unopposed. The Internet, for the first time, the truth and the lie had an equal form, and when they do, the truth has a, a, an advantage over a lie. Mm -hmm. But as he says, by giving up freedom, of, uh, of free, giving up Internet, 
Now we have people who will come in who will try to keep the truth from standing there, and they probably will try. And I they've a, done it for their individual countries. There are ways you can filter the Internet. So, that, for instance, North Koreans cannot access the Internet. Chinese cannot access the Internet, you know, all of it in China. The Russians can't. You know, um, and, but unfortunately, that's not enough for those people. They want to be able to restrict it so that we can't see everything that's on the Internet. And the, yeah. I'm afraid the day is coming. Wow. I'm afraid the day is coming. Now, you know, you talk about the, the newspaper being the gatekeeper. Right? Well, yes. Yeah. yes. And, 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 and here's a perfect example. We, we have the Oregonian here in Portland, right. which is really a very influential newspaper throughout the state. Um, they've been covering the occupy or the, the Bundy trial, U.S. versus Bundy right. at all. Right. And I, I've been watching it, uh, the coverage, and fortunately, I must give them credit. They say there's more on the Internet. And so, and, and so I actually went beyond the newspaper to some of the stuff, and then I went to the court documents. And um, there's a whole bunch of story, a whole bunch of that news, that, that trial is not being told in the newspapers. The Oregonian is not being told uh, on the, the TV stations here. And that is that the defense is putting, is doing a lot of stuff in writing that isn't being disseminated. Mm -hmm. They have made some very, very good arguments challenging the legitimacy of the prosecution from the very beginning that uh, the, the judge is not really giving, uh, really not addressing the, the uh, issues that they're raising. She's denying their emotions, but she's not explaining it legitimately, I don't think, why they're wrong. And uh, so uh, you know, that's going to go to the Ninth Circuit, which is not, not going to be a favorable place for the defendants, but ultimately go to the U.S. Supreme Court, which may not be a favorable place depending on who, who's elected president. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the truth should be told now. A and it's available, well, partly available, because the, they have links in the, uh, the Oregonian website, but only, that only takes you so far. Uh, you, in order to get the rest of the story, you have to be an attorney with a, with a subscription to PACER and, mm. and to, to look at what the court documents actually are. Uh, I spent some time doing that today, and, and I'm telling you, the, the story is not being told. Mm. What the, ar the, the real arguments made by the defense, defendants are, and they're very good arguments. Well, in all due respect, that's what the election is about right now, the national election. When you look at the media across the board, then there's a, the biases have been pretty taken on either side. You, know, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. So, so now, now that that's been done, now the election is coming on because the masses, that they've got the influence for the vote. We haven't even talked about the Electoral College. That's pretty well, it's kind of like set aside to a certain degree. But now all of a sudden, uh, we've got the masses are being approached. And that's going to be the fear. And, that's, and who's going to be in charge? Now, if you've got the money to hire people to put flyers on the doors to get to the individuals, that's one very effective way. And going to some of the other individual groups and this, that, and the other. But, uh, but, 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 but it's an issue right now. Well, I'll tell you one thing, you know, one of the things, there was an article about how much money Hillary has campaign has raised, and she's a, a campaign funding machine, just as Obama, uh, President Obama was when he was a candidate. And, and that's one of the things I think is, is really interesting about Donald Trump is he's not doing that. He, I don't know how much his money he's raised, but it's, it's minuscule compared to the Clinton fundraising, and yet he's still in the race. And I think the difference is that he knows how to project himself on TV. Mm -hmm. That TV has, TV is important. Newspaper, print newspapers is meaningless in terms of swaying voters these days. It's TV and internet and and uh, um, uh, social media. And I, I don't know if he's really on top of the social media, internet stuff, but when it comes to TV, he's a master. He's been on TV a long time. Oh, yeah, he's been very successful at it, and that comes across. Um, he has a way of getting people you know, to watch his shows when he was you know, a star. And, and now, uh, that's the best explanation as to why he's, in the can he's still in the race is he's a compelling TV uh, personality. Well, I would say also, too, that um, when you think about the Congress that we have, both houses for that time, each, each had the opportunity to solve the problem of undocumented workers. But they never did. Well, they, they're they never did. career politicians. They never did. And they Until working. he came along and said, here is the solution. 
even though we, we, we're talking about the wall and this, that, and the other, but I, I in all due respect, I, I don't see the wall because we've got the laws on the book to resolve we do. this issue right but off the bat. We have a Congress full of, uh, of intellectual cowards who are voting for their own self interest. But that's both sides. Those are Republicans oh, and oh, Democrats. Yes. I'm not saying one yeah, side. Yeah. <laughs> I said a Congress full of. I didn't. Uh, there are some principal people there, but there are heroes because there are so few. <laughs> And so the, the Congress has not done its job at all, and uh, the President has been able to run wild. But if you look at the policies, carefully look at what these people will do. Mrs. Clinton is a furtherance of a disaster for our country, and Trump is a step back towards sanity. And in some cases, a key step, because like the Supreme Court, whether it's supposed to be that way, custom and culture is they have that power and if the wrong people are appointed there there's going to be and there'll be a lot of Americans pointing out that the Second Amendment still applies to them but uh, it'll be a hell of a fight so that the, the nation we must elect Trump because he is a step back from the abyss and Mrs. Clinton is just simply a dive over it and there's, there's no question which candidate is better for the country, regardless of what you can say about their idiosyncrasies, regardless of the fact that both of us would have been much happier to have Ted Cruz standing there. But he's not standing there. And uh, the best we can hope for is this man. And you know, unusual people have come out of the woodwork and saved our country a number oh, of yeah. times. Oh, yeah. That's oh, one yeah. of the things. Freedom, first, everyone does better in freedom. People produce more than they consume. Freedom, America is an example of what human freedom is. But when you have human freedom, you also have these idiosyncratic people that go a little farther than freedom drives most of us. And America has been blessed by such people at many critical times in its history. And I think maybe we're going to have the benefit of that again now. I hope so. Well, and that's not because I visualize a president as being Donald Trump. <laughs> it's because uh, the alternative is unthinkable. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I might say one lasting moment, then we're just going on break at this point, but I was really excited about the fact that um, uh, I know everyone had issues about uh, President Obama, but as far as I was concerned, I always maintained we needed to talk <clears throat> about the issue of race. And we had those years to be able to talk about that issue, mm -hmm. aspect of it. And just the other day, there was a presentation if you will, of the, the newly uh, Smithsonian African American Museum mm -hmm. that was introduced in Washington. Mm -hmm. And they had the presentation, and um, uh, I liked the assimilation aspect of it because President Bush was there who basically led the charge, again, the Republican, leading the charge to get the monies, the bulk of the monies. But then uh, he was there, um, uh, Bill Clinton was there, uh, naturally, President Obama was there. Uh, the Speaker of the House was there. Unfortunately, the President of the Senate on the R side wasn't there because mm -hmm. uh, he made his famous note. You remember when when Obama was first elected to office, saying that he'd do everything he could to, to make sure that he didn't succeed. Now mm -hmm. I'm talking about uh, who was it? Who am I thinking about? McConnell. Rush Limbaugh? No, no. Oh. <laughs> McConnell. 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 But my point is that. But my point is that. The bulk of America was there. America was there. They accepted the fact that that uh, that, that in fact African Americans were part and parcel, and that history is sitting there. Uh, I was thinking that if the, if we can just only put that in the in the books, if you will, in our public schools, and educate our people, because in all due respect, uh, we've got all of these various holidays and whatever, but it's still that the, the the bulk of the people still don't relate to it and don't relax. But this this particular situation here, it's there. So I, I just say that uh, I think we're right on track. I, I think uh, at the end of this, uh, at the end of the day, whoever gets elected, like Art says, uh, you don't know what's going to happen, whoever gets it. But my point, the pressure is going to be whoever is going to be president of these United States. The pressure will be there. The pressure will be there as long as we got this piece. And I appreciate that very much. That's the Constitution of this country. So, gentlemen, any lasting comments real quick, like Art, any lasting points? No. No? Okay. Everybody's happy? 
<laughs> no, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> well, I'm going to have you guys it's a, back it's a, here. It's been a pleasure to be at a table with a principal man rather, got rather than these unprincipled oh, people no, no. that I have to fight all the time oh. for running for office. <laughs> well, now, now that you're going to be sitting in that seat now in the future, Art, <laughs> I know we're going to be looking at some good results. Well, there are a lot of good people trying to fix things. We're one of us. tens of thousands that are, try, that are trying to help the country, and I think... Uh, I think we'll be all right. The question is not whether America will be all right in the future. It's how far down we're going to go before we fix things. Exactly, and exactly. I'm afraid we may go a lot farther. And I will say to my viewing public, you know, regardless of what your views, that's, again, that's the beauty about this country. You know, if you've got your views, you can express them. And that's what this is all about. That's what, that's what this country is all about. It's very, very important. So share your thoughts. Sit down and have a discussion like we've had a discussion, pro or con. But at the end of the day, you got to vote. You can be registered Republican, Democrat, Independent, whatever. You can vote for whomever you want when you get that ballot. You've got that ballot. But understand, you've got to understand what the issues are. Understand what the issues are. That's a very, very important piece. But you've got to go out and register. You've got to register to vote. Not after the fact, but register before the fact and be involved. Because it is a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. And get, let's get it back. I think that was quoted by somebody I knew also, too. So let's get our country back. And it's fact. It's right. He's right on. Okay, with that, thank you very much. And we'll see you next time around. I'm checking on the next, on the next topic. Take care. Have a good one. Gentlemen. You are watching Oregon Voters Digest. This program can be seen again on these channels on these dates and times. Tell a friend. Did he, oh. Welcome back, folks, to the Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Bruce Bessard, your host. Well, guess what? Uh, I know we're right in the midst of the elections country. and whatever. We're right in the midst Everything of the elections and, and the like, and, and look like we're going to really get involved because the fact of the matter is we just happen to have a person in our midst that's running for office and from the state of Oregon who happened to be a scientist, and he's running for Congress. And when you start thinking about scientists, you start thinking about people that are constantly getting into chemicals, but basically talking about solutions. And that's a very key piece, solutions. That's what we're looking for right now in the, in the elections. But what we're going to do is that we're going to take the time out to interview a guy that I know, and we've got another person that's going to be with us, and he's going to be probably asking questions also, too. Uh, we've got uh, Jim Lewinberg that's going to be here. He's going to be sort of like a, the co-host today on this, this particular show. And then we're going to have a scientist, a guy who happens to be running for Congress in Oregon, mm -hmm. a scientist. His name is Art Robinson. Art, welcome. How you doing? Hi. Good. Fine, thank you. And we're going to, we're going to ask Art, uh, as part of defining what a scientist is and whatever, and some of the work that he's doing, but we're going to take one particular piece of work that he's doing now, that he's being doing, that is a very beneficial to this country as a whole. Very, very beneficial. Very, very beneficial. And I don't say this lightly. So um, uh, we, 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 rather than getting in, in the details of that part, I'm just going to go on and introduce you to, to Art right off the bat. Art, come on on board here. This, how you doing? I'm oh, fine. How's the campaign trail? Well, it's, it's fun. The grassroots Oregonians are really, really fine people and on all, in all parties. 
when you start talking to the politicians, it becomes a little more unpleasant. But the grassroots people are great, regardless of their party, and it's a lot of fun. But for the benefit of the viewing artists again, what, what is it that, uh, that got a scientist excited about uh, running for office? Well, I, didn't, I got excited. I got uh, frightened, I would say. During the Cold War, my uh, colleagues and I quit for several years and worked on civil defense, just like many others worked on strategic defense, because we were so alarmed by the chance of nuclear war that we had to do something. So we stopped our work, our scientific work, for a few years and worked on emergency preparedness, and particularly civil defense. Uh, this is a second journey like that, because uh, a few years ago we became so worried about the direction our take, country was taking and the loss of our freedom that we st were still doing our scientific work, but we started to spend time in politics, not because we wanted to be in politics, I never dreamed we'd be in politics, but because we realized how bad, how much bad representation in Congress was harming our country's future, just like nuclear war was a potential to harm our country's future. Mm -hmm. And what is the definition of a, of a scientist? Uh, like you well, it's a, science is a particular methodology that is used to study the natural world. Uh, it uh, really took off. Well, there were some people who you would call scientists even in antiquity. But starting with Isaac Newton, the scientific method became uh, a, a, a really large thing in human affairs. And what we do is study the natural world and find out what we can about what is there and how it works. Uh, scientists have not even scratched the surface. Uh, probably one part in a trillion of what there is to know is known by science today, and we don't even know how much of the natural world the human brain could comprehend if it, if it had, <laughs> had, had all the time in the world. But it's a lot of fun, and it has been useful because in two ways. One, uh, it's opened a greater a chance to appreciate nature. Prior to modern science, you could walk through a forest and admire the animals and the trees and so forth. Today, if you understand the biochemistry, you can walk through a forest and see in a leaf how it works, to see the molecular structure of these living things, and that is a tremendous blessing. It increases the quality of your life to, to be able to know more about the world in which you live. And the second thing is, science has served as a basis for engineering, which has marginally improved the human condition, extend double the human lifespan, and done all kinds of things to make our lives better. There's an ethic, and you have to decide what ethic will rule your life. And my belief is that there is no greater secular gift than the chance to live a human life on the earth. And so anything we do that increases the quality, quantity, or length of human life is positive. And following that ethic, uh, anything we learn in science that accomplishes that goal is good. Uh, and that's led us to do medical research as well as fundamental biochemistry. Hmm. So uh, you're interested in particular in one particular kind of research we did. You know, biochemistry is fun. When I got out of graduate school and got a job in the faculty at UCSD and then I worked at Stanford, I said, this is great, I'm going to play all my life and people are going to pay me for it. Yes, yes. Because the lab was fun, I loved it. Uh, and then I got thinking more about it as time passed and decided to spend half my time helping the people that were paying for my fun. So we spent half our time in medical research and half in basic science all my life. And the medical research has followed it, allowed us to on this path down to metabolic profiling that you talked about. And it's created a new thing. I think we probably have done something no one's ever done before. I'm, I'm the first person who's ever run for Congress and asked the voters for a urine sample. In this <laughs> But there's a, a reason for it. Mm -hmm. we, we, you want to talk about that. You know, the other thing that intrigued me about you uh, is the discipline in that whole issue of science. Yeah, you have, you to, have to be well disciplined, if you will. You have to be or you will go off it, track it, it, because it, it, nature right. won't change for you. You have to follow the truth because if you don't follow the truth, you'll just waste your time because nature isn't changing for you. You are constrained to the truth about nature. Well, that's why I have such an interest in you in regards to running for office. Well, the other thing that scientists <laughs> offer, uh, and my friend Harrison Schmidt taught me this, he, he was the last man to land on the surface of the moon. Mm -hmm. And he, uh, he ran, he helped us in our, he and Scott Carpenter helped us in our first campaign, you may remember, but he ran for the Senate then. He was a senator from New Mexico. He was said that when he was in the Senate, he was the only guy in the Capitol building that wanted to solve problems. 
We both graduated from Caltech. We're both scientists. We're trained to solve problems. It doesn't mean every time we get proposed a solution, it's the right one, but that's our training. Try to find a solution. The politicians don't do that. They tr figure out how to turn the problem to political advantage for themselves. So, for example, when there's trouble with the medical things at the VA, they just they, they enjoy the problem. They live on the problem. They give speeches saying they, want, they don't want the problem to go away because hmm. if it went away, it wouldn't help them get reelected. A scientist comes in and says, look, why don't you just give every vet a, pay, a card that pays 100% of his medical costs and tell him he goes anywhere in the country. End of problem. Mm -hmm. But the, sci the politicians don't do that. Yeah, right. right. Same That's thing with the lim lumber industry destroyed in Southern Oregon. The same thing. Politicians want to live in a problem. Politicians, uh, scientists want to solve problems. And for that reason, it would be good to have a few scientists in Congress because they might begin to uh, uh, turn the, the bodies toward occasionally solving a problem instead of just living on it politically. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, and then say, I might ask go, yeah, go we've got see. a scientist here. All right. One of the things that, that President Obama has made a big deal out of is mm -hmm. man-made uh, uh, global warming. Yeah. Okay. So you're a scientist. Yeah. You may not be an atmospheric scientist, but you're a scientist. Yeah. What does the evidence tell you oh, as I a trained scientist? Tells me. You probably don't know about our terrible reputation, but, uh, I, I wrote an article, and the Wall Street Journal asked me to write their editorial during the Kyoto meeting. And I wrote it, and then the Enviros went after me. And so we ran a petition among American scientists, and we got 31,000 scientists to sign a petition urging the government to do nothing about this bogus thing. It's entirely bogus. I hope, I've, I've read the entire literature. I've studied it very carefully. And this is just a bogus misuse of science. There's no, they're, they're wrong. Uh, the evidence that humans are affecting the climate in any significant way is zero. So, uh, and a tremendous part of the scientific world knows this, but the politicians, and in fact, uh, I was at UCSD as a student when a, a group of scientists there picked up this hypothesis and studied it very carefully. They got the CO2 monitoring station set up. They studied it very carefully, and they concluded it was not a problem. But uh, and at that time, the temperatures were going down, and so everybody was screaming about global cooling. Mm -hmm. And they started up global warming. If you look at the fluctuations in the temperature of the Earth, they're very minor now, in fact, on a historical basis. But uh, this is a completely bogus hypothesis, and I can say that from having read the entire literature and studied carefully. Now, one of the things that you said, and you're explaining why science was, what you viewed as, as good was, uh, lengthening human life, uh, improving human life. Mm -hmm. uh, so that reminds me of the, the increasing the number of people who live a human. Life. Okay, now that see, Quantity. now that reminds me of what the Greek philosophers used to say. Of course, there are a lot of different schools of thought, but one was, "Man is the measure of all things." Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, what I heard you say, which resonates for me, is that more people are good, longer lives are good, higher quality of life for human beings yeah. is good. It seems like there's a lot of people in this world today who think that man is the problem. Oh yes, they're, mm. they're, they're, <laughs> this, is, this is the continuation of the eugenics movements of the, uh, of the previous century. Uh, eugenics, by that name, fell out of favor when the Nazis overdid it, of course. Yes. But uh, uh, this is the same thing. And you see it constantly. Uh, take DDT for an example. Mm -hmm. uh, DDT, uh, the National Academy of Sciences estimated it saved 500 million lives. The man who found that application for it got the Nobel Prize. Uh, it saved hundreds of millions of lives in Africa, South America, and Asia. But for political reasons, the United States banned it and then used its power to ban it throughout the world Tens of millions of children and pregnant wow. women have died, and hundreds of millions of adults have suffered as a result of that terrible decision, a vast technological genocide of unparalleled proportions. And yet, they have taught the people to fear this substance. And, and, and where done. are those people suffering the most? Is it the continent of Africa? Africa. And well, India? Africa, South America, Asia to some extent. So who are the beneficiaries? Who oh, the beneficiaries, the there are no beneficiaries, well, but it's done by they, those this. people who think there are too many people in the world. This is, okay, simp well, this is simply population control. Um, and also global warming. We wrote a 
a definitive review article on global warming as a part of what we were doing with the climate change hypothesis. And uh, one man kept taking thousands of copies of our paper to UN meetings. Mm -hmm. And he told me he was, these all were population control meetings because they saw this as a means of population control. If you can deprive, look, if they truly are able to shrink the use of hydrocarbon fuels by 50 percent, hundreds of millions of people who are currently trying to lift themselves from poverty and tyranny with the machines powered by hydrocarbons are going to die. Yes. And wow. that's, uh, and, and to those people, it's a good thing. They don't want those others to live. Huh. But in fact, all of the predictions of what increased human population will do have failed. Uh, it's clear, if any man, uh, people, always produce more than they consume and increase their human condition if they're free to do so. The problem in our country today is that we're losing the freedom to do so. Mm -hmm. So we're running up huge debts buying things we can't produce because so much of our freedom has con been constricted, it's hard to do so. But uh, it, it's just, uh, I'm not telling you what the highest thing in the universe is. My brain's not even possible, couldn't even comprehend that. You probably couldn't even reduce it to terms that I could, that I could hear. But from our point of view, from what we can see, human life is the most important thing. Mm. And anything we do to enhance that is good. These people see, see it differently. And pretty soon, you're reading Solzhenitsyn and, and good and evil. You, it, it, it becomes beyond what you can do mathematically, mm. but becomes an ethical question of good and evil. And uh, it is just evil to kill human beings. And that's what they're doing wholesale. All right, let me ask another question, science-based. Okay, okay. Um, one of the arguments about uh, hydrocarbons, uh, gasoline, yeah. is it running out. What is the you're evidence? You're not running out, that's, okay. that's, that's nonsense. Tell, tell, tell us you, what you the evidence is. You are not running out. Firstly, uh, I'm an advocate of nuclear energy because that's the next step for humanity and is incredibly valuable. But if you talk about hydrocarbons, which are what not, runs 97% of our, our energy today, uh, we're not running out. Firstly, we have vast coal reserves, more oil than you can realize, but also we have basically an infinite supply of natural gas. Mm -hmm. Not just that that's drilled here, the methane clathrates in the shallow oceans contain more hydrocarbon energy than all the coal, oil, and land-based natural gas on Earth, and they're just beginning to be tapped. The amount of hydrocarbons we can see and recover are so vast that it's, I mean, you're talking about many, many, many centuries in the future when the limitations, well, and you're just seeing that. We have prices have now gone down because somebody figured a little better way to tap the natural gas. Hmm. Well, let me ask you another question because when I was young, I was taught that that uh, hydrocarbons were a result of uh, dead animals, dead plants. Yeah, well, that's <laughs> very unlikely to be true. Okay. Did you know that the, Rus <laughs> the Russians have probably more oil? The, the big sources of oil in the world are the, are the Middle East, the Russia, and the United States. Russian geologists believe the opposite. In in Russian <laughs> geology. Uh, all hydrocarbons are produced abiotically. In the United States, the, geology or, uh, the geologists believe that they are, to a large extent, believe they're fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. but, so the Russians look in entirely different places for oil than the Americans do, and both find it <laughs> in vast quantities. Really? So, and there's uh, more and more experimentation showing that if you, commit, if you subject uh, the, the carbon and, and uh, uh, hydrogen, to the uh, temperatures and pressures deep in the earth, you make hydrocarbons. So, and, okay. and, they're, they're, and there's these methane, the methane, that's just CH4. That's not biological, right? That's CH4. Mm -hmm. Methane is a, a, a large fraction of all the hydrocarbons on earth. And it's very hard to argue that all those methane deposits, which are continually being created more and more today even, uh, are biologically based. It's not, it's perfectly possible that a lot of hydrocarbons were produced by dead animals and plants, mm -hmm. but that's just one class of hydrocarbons, and uh, in, in any case, uh, we have plenty. The, uh, it, we should have gone nuclear. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, our electricity today with hydrocarbon fuels 
uh, costs about 10 cents a kilowatt hour for the average American. And California, maybe 15 or 20 with all their screwy rules. Uh, nuclear power, out, sitting outside of Phoenix, is a new power of Verde, Palo Verde nuclear power station. It was intended to have 10 reactors. Each reactor produces twice the power of Hoover Dam. Hmm. That's three, that's six Hoover Dams. The power is less than two cents a kilowatt hour. Hmm. Today, the Chinese are building a lot of nuclear power plants, and we're not. And a lot of coal plants, too, though. Well, they need energy by any way they can get it. Right. But uh, uh, the, our engineers uh, predicted in the 1970s that with private capital, the nuclear power would expand in the United States that until by the year 2000, we would have the equivalent of 40 Hoover dams in every state just from nuclear power reactors. Mm -hmm. If we had that today, our country would basically have an unlimited supply of very low cost energy and all our industries would come back from abroad just for that. <clears throat> if our heavy industries have moved abroad, they would all be back here if we gone nuclear. Now we didn't go nuclear, but we still are living in the hydrocarbon age, which is a very wonderful age because of what hydrocarbon fuels can do. And these idiots, the same people that stopped our nuclear power industry, are now trying to stop our hydrocarbon power industry, right. which moves you back to the Middle Ages. Now, on that note, I apologize, folks. Gee whiz, this is getting very, very interesting. As you can see, we have some very interesting talk shows right here on Oregon Voters Digest. We may have to just go and extend that on another show. Yeah, we didn't Please even get to the urine. Folks. I realize. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. I'm going to take a urine stop. Okay. Okay. Great. <laughs> okay. Oh, well, you're going to go. I'm, 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 I got to go. <laughs> that's gotta, why we're quitting. Give you, you that's need right. to go. I, I got to get the sample that. for you to talk about. Be it. sure to take one of our little cups with I you. I will definitely do that. that cryogenic I, will, I will definitely do that. Okay. Gentlemen, thank you very much for being on the show. Appreciate that very much. All right. Thanks. Always a pleasure. Okay. Always a pleasure, Jim. Always a pleasure. And Art folks, like I said, theory. those discussions, like I said, this that's a very key piece. We're going to have Art and Jim back here, and we are going to talk about the urine issue. Okay? Yeah. Maybe about the 10th or the 12th. How's that? Sounds great? Fine with me. Sounds great good. with me. Folks, take care. Have a good one. This has been Bruce Broussard and Jim Lewenberger and Art Robinson, who's running for Congress. Running for Congress. Gee, he's got his sign over there. Is it? We like Art yeah, Robinson. I Congress. agree with that. Isn't that something? <laughs> take care, folks. I'll see you next time around. Have a good one. Thank you.